Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Barb Morgan, our instructor of general studies. Um, she's a true Southeast Alaska gal, born and raised here. Whenever I have a question that's biology related, she's one of the very first people I think of. So she's all, always ready to share her knowledge and time with the UAS, UAS Ketchikan and our community. Please help me welcome her. Okay, I'm going to stand on this side, I think. Mm -hmm. more room over here. Thank you for coming tonight, and it's my pleasure to be able to actually talk to you about some wildflowers. I um, did grow up in this area and uh, have been accumulating information in my head about wildflowers and plants and stuff on the beach. I'm kind of a generalist. I like knowing a little bit about everything. So um, I am focusing on wildflowers tonight, and I am. Can you get the lights and, so they can see the slides, please? Um, over the course of the last few Whoa. years, I've been just taking pictures of wildflowers, and so I just kind of included all of the best pictures of things, and some of the ones that are not maybe quite as great of pictures, but it shows what something is. And there's a few things around here that are kind of not all that common um, that I wanted to share with you as well. So I'm gonna start, I've, I've got a lot of pictures, so <laughs> I, I promised them I would try not to go over an hour. <laughs> um, I'm going to start at the beach and then kind of work my way up to the alpine and kind of concentrate on areas that you'll find different kinds of wildflowers. I've got pictures of them and a little bit of information I'm going to share about each one. If you have questions about any of them, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask um, as we go along instead of waiting to the end, okay? So, um, first place we're going to start is down on the beach fringe and really literally right above the highest high tide line, you will start seeing plants and flowering plants there. So, our first one is what's called giant vetch. And you can see there's some flowers here. They're, kind of, they're in the pea family, they're a legume. Um, the flowers are kind of pink and um, they look pretty cool in the sun, actually. They grow, they grow in a big bramble right above where there's gonna be all of those uh, logs um, washed up on the beach. The giant vetch, or, or um, Vicea gigantea, is report it as poisonous, or maybe not very poisonous, or you could probably eat it, but not very much. Um, I was taught that it was poisonous, you shouldn't eat it. Um, the part you would eat is the pea kind of seed inside the pod, and I don't, I've never eaten it because it might be poisonous. And <laughs> <laughs> similar actually with the beach pea, the Lathyrus duponicus maritimus, it's uh, really pretty, I like seeing it, it makes a nice pea as well. If I was ever starving, I might try to eat some of the pea um, after it's developed, but it also might be a little bit poisonous. Um, one place I read said, don't make more than 30% of your diet be this pea, or else you might get poisoned. Like, well, 30% a lot. <laughs> so this is right above the high tide line as well, and I love seeing those. Um, it's also a legume. Um, the foliage on this, the, the leaves are a little bit more round than mm. on the giant vetch. It's kind of longer and slimmer kind of a leaf sort of a situation there. It's one of the ways you can tell the difference between the two of them. Uh, the chocolate lily is also right above the high tide line. And uh, it's Fritillaria Kamchat census. And it's also called rice root. And you can eat that. You can dig up the root and it's kind of a nodule with little rice-like nodules around it, and that's edible. Um, you don't want to smell it, it smells like poop. <laughs> okay, so um, there's not a lot of them. If I was ever starving, I would go ahead and try eating some of it, but I don't harvest it to eat now. I'm not starving, and I don't want to impact it a lot. It's, uh, there's, you don't find big patches of it that come back every year. You find small, kind of scattered patches of it. So. Um, chocolate lily is fun to look at. Don't smell it. You can eat it if you're starving. Yeah. Uh, the scarlet paintbrush, the uh, Castellasia cochinea, um, that is not actually a flower that you're seeing there. The bracts are specialized leaves that protect the flower of different plants. Almost all flowers have some kind of a bract sort of a situation. On this plant, those bracts are really elongated and, and maximized and brilliant red. So it looks like a paintbrush that's been dipped in, in red paint. There's other ones um, like yellow paintbrush and whatnot. 
Um, it's not the flower. The flower is actually deep inside there and is really inconspicuous and you, you have to really dig around in there to find it and you, what, I don't know. You can't, it's, it's really inconspicuous. Um, it is hemiparasitic, which means that, and you can see here, it's got green in its <coughs> leaves and its brats, so it can photosynthesize, but it can also steal food from the grass that's growing around it through its roots, just kind of leaches out nutrition from the grasses around it, which isn't very nice, but it is how it helps make its living. And so it's, um, you'll see it kind of scattered in amongst a lot of the, the grasses and sedges um, that are growing on the tidelands a lot of the time, or in wet meadows as well. I put it down on the beach fringe area. I had to choose one place. Um, <coughs> you'll also see the shooting stars, Dodecath Dodecathon Polchellum. And those grow on the beach fringe just above the high water line. You can also find them in wet meadows and kind of edges of forested, kind of sunny, but not super sunny areas. And um, they have a pretty nice sweet smell to them. Um, I don't think you can eat them, but they're pretty to look at, called shooting stars. <coughs> they're purple, that's one of my favorite colors. <laughs> The yellow sink foil is something that that can grow on like it's it's just above the high tide line, and sometimes just like barely. Um, I took this picture on a rock on the outside of everything on the past Duke Island, past everything almost, um, sitting out there, super exposed to the the open ocean. Pretty sure during storms, waves go crashing over it, and there's this yellow sink foil there, which is the Potentilla villosa, and uh, beautiful yellow flowers hanging onto the rock there. Pretty stubborn. Some days, mm. I wish I could be that stubborn, <laughs> hang on like that. So, um, and then the common butterwort is not all that common. Um, a friend of mine, Joseph Quitzland from Petersburg, actually sent me this photo and said, what is this? I'm like, well, I figured it out. And I sent it back. I'm like, it's a common butterwort. He says, oh, he goes, I didn't think it was going to be common because I don't hardly, it's just the first time I've ever seen it. And it's not common here. It's common in other parts of the world, but not here. So um, it's called the common butterwort because it's common in the place where it was found first and named. Um, but it's not common here. One of the cool things about it is that the leaf surface is this kind of roseate of uh, leaves on the base there. And the surface of every one of the leaves is coated with a slime that um, has enzymes in it that can dissolve bugs. And so this is a carnivorous plant. Yeah. Is it related to the figwort? The flower is kind of like that, but <coughs> it's not hairy looking in the it, figwort. I'm not sure if it's related to the figwort or not. Um, Just from the name, I mean. And th that's not a bad guess. Uh, wart, it just means plant. <laughs> I've learned that recently. I'm like, okay, well, that's <laughs> kind of... <laughs> so anything ending in wart is, just means it's, a, it's like butter plant. This is butter plant. Common butter plant. Okay. Um, I think the fig words might be different, but I'm not positive about that. Yeah. Um, so they, this... Behind here, behind the plants, is a rock. That's like a sheer rock cliff that yeah. it's growing on, close to a beach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, where are where are they common? Is it is it pretty In far away? Or? Europe. Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it growing? Sorry. So the, it's basically growing on a sheer, like almost sheer cliff, with a slight slant back, and so there's just enough no. for them to be able to grow on the face of the cliff there. Mm -hmm. It kind of looks like a sandy beach almost, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's a cliff face. Yeah. You said they're common in Europe. Were yeah. they invasives? Were they brought here? Do um, I don't know? think so. There are plants that actually are circumpolar in distribution. Plants are kind of curious. There are some plants that have very specific, very small ranges that only grow in like very, like, okay, not very much area. And then other plants that will grow all around the whole circumpolar area, all the countries involved in that. So, yeah, and everything in between. Um, so moving up into the forest ecosystem, which is most of what we have around here, honestly. Um, and salmon berries, we all love 
Yeah. Yeah. Respectabilis. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first flowers, not the very first, one of the first flowers that comes out in the spring. And then we get salmon berries out of it too. So what's not to like about that? Mm -hmm. And they're hot pink, super visible. Uh, related, same genus even, are the thimbleberries. They have a, this so kind of sweet. bigger, fluffier white flower. Um, and they make the thimbleberries, which are also really lovely. Same genus, mm -hmm. really related. Uh, these bloom later in the summer. They're not blooming right now. I went out this afternoon to go, okay, I'm talking about wildflowers. Let's see. What I, so you can see what I found on the back table there. Not a lot blooming yet, but some. We're getting there. Um, Ribes bracteosum is the stink or blue current, and you can see some of the flowers here underneath. They kind of hang in these long skeins underneath. Sometimes they're kind of pointing upwards at first, and then they'll kind of hang over. And each one of those flowers will turn into a berry that um, some people really like them. My mom's favorite berry. And other people like really don't like them because they have a really pretty strong kind of musky taste to them. Um, she, it, she makes them into jam and that's her favorite kind of jam. So um, I like them. They just look just delicate and, and uh, I don't know, pretty. So pretty flowers. The berries are good too. <laughs> Um, this is a plant that you can call rusty menziesia. Its uh, scientific name is menziesia pharyngea, and it's, called, it's also called fool's blueberry. And it's all over around here. People call it buckbrush, some people do. And it has a, bit, a blossom that is quite a bit like the blueberry blossom, but the leaves are kind of a little bit hairy, fuzzy, and sticky. And blueberry leaves are never sticky. Um, these don't turn into nice, plump, lush, ripe berries to eat either. They just kind of turn into a brown little seed pod that's not very exciting at all. So, mm -hmm. um, but the flowers are this kind of pretty, um, kind of delicate pink kind of a color. So they're, and they're all over the place once they bloom. So I took this along um, Ward Lake Trail. This is blueberry here and um, Another difference you'll notice is that the fool's blueberry, when it's blooming, the leaves have already come out and it's been photosynthesizing for a little while. The true blueberries, Alaska blueberry, Vaccinium ovalifolium, and the rest of the Vaccinium um, berries, um, they will bloom before the, the leaves start coming out. Um, the berries and the stems and the leaves are not, none of them is not sticky. I suppose if you smash a berry, that would be sticky, but the leaves are not sticky. Is that the berry that's real black colored? This is the one that's kind of a dusty oh, blue. Okay. okay. And the ones that turn really like the super black, shiny black ones, those flowers are kind of a deeper reddish pink. Okay. And you can see both of them, they've been both out um, now. So that one that you're talking about, I think it's Oval, um, uh, Vaccinium alaskense oh, is the, name, the scientific name of it. So, yeah. Um, Pacific crabapple, which has a really nice cluster of, of uh, flowers, Malus fusca, and that also, this is around, a lot of these pictures I got around, Ward Lake is a great place to, to walk. And you can walk it frequently and watch how things change over the course of the seasons. And a lot of things bloom around Ward Lake. If you kind of just keep an eye on it, go every few days, every couple of weeks, whatever, new things will be blooming throughout the whole year. Um, crab apples actually do pretty well around here, but the, the fruits on the crab, our native crab apples are pretty small, like the size of my pinky kind of, maybe a little bigger, not super big, but the birds like to eat them, which is good. Um, Spirea douglasii, the Spirea, the rose Spirea, this is all over around Ward Lake area and it has a nice smell to it, kind of um, sweet, makes it smell sweet. So that's, I don't think there's any, I don't know if they're, they're pretty, there's no medicinal use that I know of with them. Um, red elderberry, this is a, um, this is kind of an interesting plant. It's uh, Sambucus racemosa. We have red elderberries around here, and further south, we have, there are the blue or purple elderberries, and the the purple elderberry um, 
it does have medicinal value. You can go down to the health food store here and buy Sambucus and there's a few different kinds and there's gummies and whatnot. It's actually one of the things that the USDA is acknowledging <coughs> that um, actually is effective against colds and flus. So the, the purple one. There's some question and some that's mixed. I haven't found a really good source yet about whether or not the red elderberries also have that same medicinal property or not. Um, the flower smells really wonderful, real like vanilla kind of. Um, makes a lot of pollen. If you are <laughs> pollen allergies, then it's not so much fun. Uh, the plant itself, though, the leaves and, the, and the, the twigs and whatnot, if you break them, have a really, really pungent, um, acrid kind of a smell. So if you smell the flowers, well, they're on the, the bush, they smell great, but as soon as you break it off, you break the stem, it releases kind of an acrid smell to it. So that kind of different anyway. so um, and they may or may not have uh, some people think that actually the, the seeds of the berry actually do have some cyanide in them but if you process them right and get the seeds out then they're not poisonous but you don't want to eat them whole because then you are eating some some cyanide which is probably not a good idea <laughs> yeah this is salal um, or smiling berries, people call them. You can see down here. Um, you can see kind of in the bottom here, there's like an X kind of, of the way that it grows. And if you pinch it, if you pick it up and you pinch it like this, it kind of makes that X kind of go into a smile, sort of. <laughs> they're happy berries. And the, the, the blossoms, um, they're not out yet, but last year was a good year for Salal, um, Galthoria Shallon, and uh, there's a, all kinds of, uh, and the berry, the, the flowers are, they last a long time. Um, the plant itself is an evergreen, and so you can see the leaves and twigs and everything green all year round. Um, they're beautiful in any kind of like bouquets or something like that you want to put them in. Are those low growing? Do they, they are usually pretty low. They can grow from like really low up to like about like this. And if you're trying to wade through them and they're above your knees, <laughs> it's not easy because they're kind of a real tangled mash and they can grab you by the ankles and throw you onto the ground. <laughs> 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 yeah, but usually you see them there something like this tall. Yeah. Is it edible? The berries are really edible. Yeah, they're edible. And they're really, and they're really good. They have uh, a little the, um, kind of a dense sweet taste to them. It's not really musky so much as just a lot of flavor. They're not acidic at all. There's like very little acid taste to them. So it's a, just a really sweet berry. It's also very good. I love berries. <laughs> oh, and one of the things I should say too is that they've done studies, so phytonutrients and been doing a lot of the phytonutrients are in the news a lot fairly recently um, talking about how good they are for us they're um, they have really good antioxidant um, capabilities and, and take care of free radicals in our body and we should be eating more of them and berries are a good source of them and blueberries are a really good source of them and these have like way more phytonutrients and antioxidants in them than blueberries so they're like super super healthy um, and they make a, make a great pie, and the pie is like super purple. <laughs> Which I wonder if there's a correlation between how purple they are and how much phytonutrient capacity there is. But who knows? Anyway, they're a good berry. Um, they're hard to pick because you can't just like pluck them off of there. You have to kind of pinch the stem off so that the insides just stay behind as you get. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Scissors and snip them off. That can yeah, work. It's big lumps, bunches of them. Yeah. Pull that off. So this is. I'm looking down. Actually, this plant was probably a little above my knee height, and I I took the picture facing down because I wanted to show how like the top of that is like an absolute flat. It's called an umbel. All of the that there's a flower stalk that comes up, and then all the little stalks and all the flowers and on a plane like that. Um, Heracleum lanatum, and you can eat this. The stem is edible. The outside of the stem is hairy, and those hairs have toxins in them. So, and depending on how 
um, dry and w sunny the summer is, mm -hmm. uh, um, the mm -hmm. toxin will be even like more effective. So you want to wear gloves if you're harvesting this and peel it and don't get any of the hairs on the inside part and then you can eat the inside part only. Yeah. And <laughs> so this is another one that I've not ever eaten because I, I um, do have allergies and I don't want to give myself blisters <laughs> by trying to harvest something like so. But if you are brave, you can <laughs> <laughs> try it out let me know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it tastes like celery. That's right. Nathan Jackson told me that was that how do you eat this is that you, you wear gloves and you peel it and then after you peel the whole thing is that you hold your lips back from your teeth and you <laughs> it when you bite it oh so you don't God. get any of it on your lips. And I, that that would work, but I'm not. I'm not that. He's braver than me. Yeah. <laughs> So this is a really this is a really fun flower. Um, they usually have two leaves, which you can see here. Sometimes and the, the leaves are pretty long and slender. This is uh, classified as a forb, so it's a little plant that grows on the forest floor. A uh, single flower that comes up like this. The uniflora part means single flower, like Clitonia uniflora. Um, beautiful to see. And then each flower makes one bright blue berry. Yay, there's berries all over the forest floor. Those are deadly poisonous. <laughs> okay, don't eat those. <laughs> like really poison. Um, the flower picture I got at Ward Lake and the berries um, at Lunch Creek, and they're really, they're really fun because they went, they're like crayon blue. They're not just like kind of, they're blue. And they're fun to see, but you don't, I mean, really don't, those are, those are, don't eat those, those are poison. So go check them out. Leave them there. <laughs> um, common buttercup, we have them all over the place. And um, this was the best picture I could get that day. My phone camera was the only thing I had, and it was happy <laughs> taking pictures of the vegetation, but the flowers are a little blurry, so I apologize. But, um, they are all over the place. Um, Ranunculus acris, it's the common buttercup, and they're, oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're fun to see. Mm -hmm. you know, the edges of the forest. <laughs> yeah. They're also that. poisonous, though, aren't they? Um, probably, actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, the Queen's Cup lily, does anything eat them? Or Not that I know no? of. And you oh, see okay. them, I mean, maybe slugs. Oh, okay. But I've, I've, I've never, so I've, have you, say again? Yeah, in my yard, they come and eat those. Yeah. Deer can eat any. Slugs are, they're, they um, can't. Yeah. I don't, like deer, I don't think deer eat them. You'll see other things around them being browsed off, and then and those are just left alone. So, yeah. Um, this is the creeping red raspberry, which is really prolific around here, all over the place. Um, it's also called the five finger bramble because it has the five petals to it. Um, it's a, it's, there's three little teeny plants about this tall um, that are evergreen. And so deer eat them all year round. They depend on them. They're really important. Um, last summer was actually one of the, 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 was white. My camera doesn't like taking pictures of white flowers either. It's kind of difficult. But it was a really, really nice summer last summer sunny and they bloomed which I'd never really seen before and produced berries um, creeping red raspberry rubus pedientis this is actually related to salmon berries and thimble berries in the same genus um, you'll find them all over the place in the forest they, they live actually very close I didn't put them right next to each other they, um, the miniature dogwood they live actually scattered in the same areas um, but you don't always see them blooming or with berries. So I got to eat a few berries last year. They taste kind of sweet and tart and pretty good, but they're really kind of small. And you have, I mean, you, they're not worth trying to collect them and bring them home. You just eat them there if you find any, so, yeah. And they always come in that four berry cluster? Um, so I, w I found them between one, either one, two, three, or four, between one and four, but not more than that. So, yeah. This is uh, Prunella vulgaris, which is the, the common self heal, and this grows all over. It's little though; it's like little, um, and you would 
it's kind of easy to miss. Uh, this was along the path out at Ward Lake as well. It's it, it does it, when it comes up. It's like wow, everywhere exactly. And um, mm -hmm. this looks like it could be like a big plant, but it was like this tall, and it would be pretty easy to walk by and just go, okay, there's some like purpley in the green in the grass, whatever. <laughs> but when you kind of zoom in on it, it's really purple, and the the flowers are actually pretty. Um, they're kind of interesting. They've got the, the long tube kind of, and then um, the petals are pretty modified to be kind of. Well, interesting looking. I like them. <laughs> um, the Nutka Lupin. This picture actually, I put it in the. I kind of some of the things grow in both the forest and like the beach fringe area. This was actually taken right and actually clear up the alpine. The Lupin grow all over the place, just above the beach, through the forest, kind of along the edges of the forest and up into the alpine. Um, they are easy to tell what they are if you aren't able to recognize the flower, the, um, the, fla the, the leaf is uh, palmately compound. And so that means that all of the leaflets come out from a central point, just like fingers on a hand. So you can see that here, there's the center point here and then all of the, the leaves coming out around that. So palmately compound. <coughs> and they're purple. You shouldn't eat them though, they're not good to eat. They're fairly toxic actually. <laughs> Um, this is Western Rattlesnake Root, the nab, nab, Nabilis alta, alitas, alitas. Some of these signs, you just have to say it with confidence though, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the Rattlesnake Root, the flower is fairly just kind of like, okay, it's a white flower that's sort of hanging there. There's a bunch of them all at the top. But the leaves are pretty cool looking. They're um, kind of arrowhead shaped and they're almost scalloped because they're, they've at the end of each of the veins is kind of a point almost, and they come to a point. So they're kind of dramatic looking. It's kind of fun to use rattlesnake root. The twin flower, twin flower Linnaeus borealis. Um, and there is, this is a kind of, these are little like this. The, the leaves only come up like about like this, and then the stalk comes up. And then on each stalk, there is these two flowers on the end of each one. Um, you get like whole little kind of embankments a little bit along the pathway or something. And they, they smell really sweet. Um, and it's a little surprising to me because it's this little teeny flower. How can it make the whole area just smell so wonderful? But, but they do, so that's kind of a fun flower to see. This is the miniature dogwood here. Um, this is also important deer fodder. So um, stays green year round. Right now, last year's growth is dying back, but then the new growth will come up and there'll be barely a gap in between the two of them. Um, and deer can eat those year round. And um, especially in the winter time when there's not a lot of other food, this provides them with some, some much needed nutrition. Um, the flowers look like dogwood. The um, scientific name, Cornus canadensis, um, they are dogwood. The Another name for them is bunchberry because the flowers then turn into the ovaries, develop into berries um, that are bright red and they're edible and they taste like wet cardboard. <laughs> 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 I don't like them very much. They call them filler berries. But you, yeah. you can, yep, you can extend other berries with them if you don't have quite right. enough for a batch of jam. You can collect some of these <laughs> or something. But so. did you read about how they send out their uh, seed? How do they send out their seeds? Because they're all so evenly dispersed, mm -hmm. they yeah. um, eject them. Mm -hmm. So the berries you've seen, do. You've seen the yeah. berries, they're just big fields of them. Mm -hmm. So they just shoot them out. <laughs> mm. Right. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do they give a taste to the other berries? Oh, no, the oh, other oh, berries oh, add oh, taste oh, to oh, the, oh, these oh, berries. Yes. Oh, they they have have Three or four different kinds of violets in this area, and these two are pretty common. I actually took both of these pictures around Ward Lake again. I do walk other places besides Ward Lake. <laughs> it's actually it's a great place right there. The transition between a lake and the forest makes that a really rich kind of area right in there. Um, so the, there are uh, Viola glabella and Viola epipsilla. Um, the smooth yellow violet and the marsh violet. And these are again are like, they're, they're small plants. Um, both of them are edible 
and they're also medicinal. So you can make a syrup with the flowers that's apparently good for a cough. That's how much I know about that. Um, some people confuse these with the deer heart because the leaf is heart shaped, you can see here. Um, this one right here you can see kind of is heart shaped, but the, the vein pattern on this is branching and the edge of the leaf is scalloped. And on the deer heart, the vein pattern is linear. It just goes from the, from the, the start point cleared out to the edge of the leaf. Every single vein doesn't branch at all. And the edge of the leaf is smooth. So both have heart-shaped leaves, but they still look different, the, the violet leaves and the deer heart leaves do. <coughs> this is the deer heart, um, which is also called false lily of the valley. And actually, I learned it as false lily of the valley in Juno, the Juno campus with my biology teacher there. I was like, okay, great, because when the flowers bloom, they look kind of like lily of the valley, but not quite, so it's false lily of the valley. Great. And I moved to Ketchikan, and people were like, talking about deer heart, and you know about deer heart, and I'm like, I don't know, what are you talking about? And finally somebody showed me, I'm like, oh, you mean false lily of the valley? Mm, no, this is deer heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Known as Canada Mayflower also. Canada May? Canada. Canada flower. Mayflower. Mayflower. Canada Mayflower. Canada Mayflower. Okay. Well, that's not even, so I was wondering if it was going to be in the scientific name, which is uh, Myanthemum dilatum, and dilatatum, and I don't, it's not, so that's, I put the scientific names up here. I don't always use them. I don't even know all of them, but I looked them up because there's one scientific name for each thing, and it might change. There's actually some that are changing based on like DNA work and being able to understand the genetics. The scientific name of different things shows relatedness between different organisms and so that can change. But there's still only one scientific name for each organism. And there's lots of common names and it can lead to a lot of confusion because are you talking about deer heart or <coughs> Canada Mayflower or you know Fossil Valley? Who knows? But if everybody used scientific names, then we would always know what people were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> people need to get with the program. Yeah. 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 It's not going to happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wrong way. Okay, so this is um, uh, Campanula rotundifolia, and people call it either bluebells or harebells, and the flower has five petals that are fused for most of the length of them to making kind of this really deep cup shape. Um, and the, the leaf, the, the stem, okay, the stem is really long and skinny and the leaves are really super deeply cut and narrow. So um, the whole thing looks pretty lacy. And those, those grow in the forest, um, kind of on cliff faces. Um, I've seen them actually down close to the water's edge as well. Um, so they just like nodding their heads there. Mm -hmm. People call them bluebells of Scotland sometimes too. So um, they are in the Campanula genus though. And this is called white marsh marigold. Caltha leptocepala. And I've, I, this, was, I did this one and then the next two flowers I actually figured out last summer because I had conflicting information and didn't know what was what between this one and that one mm. and that one. I actually knew what, what this one was, but deer cabbage and the white marsh marigold I had confused. Both of them have white flowers and both of them have kind of this kidney shaped um, leaf. But this has a kidney shaped leaf, but then kind of more of a a, a typical flower, people think it was a typical flower. Um, the bob bean looks just totally different, but then <coughs> the deer cabbage has the kidney shaped leaf and then the, the star shaped white flower, a lot like the bob bean. So to me, I remember this because like, okay, so the white marsh marigold has the, the kidney shaped leaves and a typical flower. Bob bean has the star shaped white flower, and the deer cabbage looks like a combination of those two to me. <laughs> That's how I remember it now. 
Um, and those three, the, this is a this is kind of a marsh plant actually, and I took this picture, the, both of these pictures, um, along the edge of the frog pond, one of the bigger ponds of the frog ponds there. Um, and they do have these kind of hairy sort of projections off of the petals, which is kind of interesting. You can see them better up close. Um, so, so white marsh marigold, and that likes kind of semi-wet area. Um, not super wet, but a little bit wet. The bog bean likes it really wet, Mignathes trifoliata, and it is the trifoliata part, and the scientific name is, it has like, its leaves are subdivided into threes, like this. So that's part of being able to figure out what it is, too. The purple part is part of the, un the flower has to open. Yeah, the flower buds before they open are, are purple on the tip, and then they open, and it's, they're totally white on the inside. So. Which is it? I mean, you have to go to the frog ponds in kind of later summer, and you can see them there. Oops, wrong way again. Okay, and then deer cabbage. And these, when they're before they're open, they do not have the purple on the tips. They're just white. So that's a difference between the two of them too. Nephrophilidium cristigali is the deer cabbage, and deer like eating them. This is wild mint, um, and you would not notice the flowers if you just were walking by. I was being particularly like, what? inquisitive. Mm -hmm. um, these are I mean, the leaves here. This leaf is probably about like this long or something. Those flowers are, are like they're teeny. You just can't. I would say like, well, they come with purple though. So, what happens if I zoom in with my camera and did that and got this picture which shows that they're beautiful little purple flowers in there and they're just blooming close to the stem in between the um, the nodes where leaves are coming off so and the whole plant smells good mint you can use this it's a tea it's supposed to settle your stomach you can use it in food as a seasoning so wild mint we have around here with a beautiful flower. So we have a few, people are often surprised to learn that we have a few different kinds of orchids in this area. Um, but we do. And the important thing to know is that you cannot pick them. You can take pictures, but it is actually illegal to pick them or try to transplant them. It's illegal because um, there's a 100% failure rate when you try to transplant them. So you're just killing them. And they're pretty rare, and so we don't want to wipe them out. So enjoy them where they are, take pictures, um, and leave them where they are so that people can continue to enjoy them later. Um, Calypso bulbosa, and this is frequently you find like maybe one stem, there's like one or two leaves and then one stem. Um, usually and sometimes you find like two or three of those in an area I found a patch of like a dozen or 18 of them in one area which is kind of fun um, it was a kind of a uh, semi is a little bit sunny uh, south facing beach just up from the beach into the forest there um, and these were these are some of my favorite flowers around here so yeah uh, I, I think it was these ones I think I sent you a picture on uh, yeah. Facebook. I don't know if it was these ones, but uh, out at South Point Beach, just like right past they, the beach line. This one? Oh, yeah. Okay. Never yeah. Mind. yeah, it was the coral root. Yeah. So this is the is Calypso bulbosa, and it, um, they are, orchids don't make their own, they don't photosynthesize, really. They, <coughs> most of them, the ones we have around here, no, that's not true. Some of them, this one doesn't, okay? Um, it's, it's a parasitic plant that grows on other plants. Um, all of the orchids have pretty ornate um, flowers that are designed to attract and then guide particular pollinators inside of them. So when they pollinate them, they get pollen on them, and when they get to the next flower, that transfers off into the next flower. So, um, This one is not a great picture. The whole thing is green, including the flowers, which you can see are quite blurry. Sorry about that. But I want to put it in here. It's not commonly seen. 
It's called Northern Tway Blade Orchid because it has two blades or two leaves um, at the base of it. Um, Listeria borealis. And I took this picture on the Coast Guard Trail last summer. Um, so that's kind of fun. Uh, this is one that you took pictures of too. Um, this is a different patch of them. Mm -hmm. And when you see them from afar, they look kind of like strange pink fuzzy. What's going on there? You, you don't know. To, but when you get really close, and I zoomed in, you can see that the the flowers are really pretty gorgeous and ornate and streaked and ornamented um, as orchids are. Um, this one is completely saprophytic. It doesn't make its own food at all. It take it steals from its neighbors, which is not uncommon actually. Um, they do not transplant well. I mean, they don't, don't. They don't transplant. So just enjoy them where they are and feel lucky that you saw an orchid. Pretty much. This is called a pine sap, uh, Monotropa hypopitus, and they uh, they live in the forest. Um, they live. Um, pine actually tells you that. I mean, they like to live underneath uh, conifer trees, and they are also 100% parasitic. They. Yeah. They steal their food from the roots of the trees um, around them. There's actually a fungus, a mycorrhizal fungus, that makes a bridge between the root of the conifer and this root, and that fungus passes nutrition over to the pine sap. Wow. So, yeah. and it's got pretty little flowers there at the tip. So I saw that around Ward Lake, too. <coughs> see, Ward Lake, you got to just go to Ward Lake if you want to see flowers. <laughs> All there is to it. Um, there's a whole class of classification of plants that grow in disturbed areas. So what's a disturbed area? Clear Land, cut. Land, <laughs> landslide? A yeah. landslide or a clear cut. Um, clear cuts are disturbed, but they roadside. don't actually have a lot of these plants. They, they start regrowing with typical normal forest plants so quickly that the disturbed plants don't really have a chance to get in there. But uh, did somebody say roadside? Yeah. That's actually one of the main ones we have, yeah. Can I ask a question on the previous slide? Yep. How do the mycorrhizal, the fungus part, how does it get associated with the pine sap? Do they have the, to show up together or does the pine sap that's include That's a great question. Include the yeah. One of the really interesting and great things about our forests around here is that that mycorrhizal fungi is already there. And it's connecting um, the roots of trees and plants to each other and to the soil around them. And so we think of plants being able to put their roots down and be able to suck water up into themselves and the nutrients that they need, minerals and whatnot, but they really actually can't do that by themselves. If there wasn't for the mycorrhizal um, fungi, so all of the little fungi filaments meet all of the roots of the plants and actually pump water up into the plants and pump all of the um, uh, minerals and whatnot that they need up into the plants. And in exchange, all the plants actually feed them by giving them sugars and starches that they make <coughs> through photosynthesis. So it's a great relationship. And that's why if you take forest soil around here and you want to use it in your um, like household plants or something like that, and you sterilize it because you don't want any nasty anything growing in it by like putting it in the oven and cooking it, which is what some people do, you're killing off all of that mycorrhizal fungi, which would actually help your plants grow. And so it is then not good soil to use because it doesn't have all of the microbiology it needs to go along. Are the these, these filaments are basically white or creamy white, and they're so firm that we don't normally see them in the soil all that much. Sometimes if soil's been sitting for a long time, you'll break it, and you can kind of see a little bit of white fuzziness kind of there. Um, you can see a lot of it in rotten wood. It's actually um, so much of it grows into the rotten wood, and, and it's decaying it then, too. Um, that you can see the white fibers in the wood then. So the, the mycorrhizal fungi are already there. And so the pine sap is just like, yay, let me just tap into this system that's already being fed by the trees and just steal some of that away from myself. Is there one species of the fungus everywhere or are there? There's varieties? lots of species. So the, so the, the mushrooms that you see that are, are growing, the different kinds of mushrooms, there's all kinds of mushrooms that grow around here. So. Um, I'm actually totally and completely blinking on all the names. Bull eats, um, all the different kinds of mushrooms. Amanitas, um, the chanterelles, all of those are the fruiting bodies 
of these mycorrhizal fungi. So we think of those as the whole entire organism, the chanterelle mushroom, but it's really literally like picking an apple off of a tree. And that the rest of the, the tree, the fungus, is underneath the soil, still alive, still doing its thing. So does it take a specific species of the uh, fungus to associate with the pine sap? I don't know that, but there are particular <coughs> fungi that do better with, there, there's some plants that need the association with particular species of fungi. And so I, would, I don't know if these are specific to one kind of fungi or if they can benefit from a lot of different ones. They do grow, though, underneath conifer trees. And so whatever fungi would benefit the conifers, I'm guessing are also the ones that benefit them. Yeah. I want to ask more questions, but I <laughs> off the real topic. <laughs> it's a good, those are good questions. Uh, that's about as much as I can probably do. I'm kind of guessing a little bit there too, but anyway. Um, so disturbed areas. Back to the disturbed areas. Um, and those are like along the roadsides, um, around people's houses, places where people have cleared off. In gardens, gardens are great disturbed areas, which... Um, why people yeah. hate dandelions? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> and as a, you know, gardening, I don't, I dig them up, get rid of them, that's, but um, I don't think we should be spraying. They're actually, they're, they're a great plant. There's a few different reasons why they're great plants. Um, number one is that they are one of the first, they, they're all over right now. They're yeah. blooming all over right now. They're, they're the main flower that's blooming right now. What really needs those right now for food? Deer, oh, bees, bees. Oh, bees. bees, really need it. So one of the earliest flowers make a lot of pollen, a lot of pollen, and the bees really need that pollen early in the spring when they first are getting going as a food source. And uh, bees are having trouble right now. Bees need all the help they can get, and dandelions are good for bees. So that's number one reason. Um, they're edible for other things like deer and people and whatnot. People, you can actually buy dandelion greens at Safeway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they are healthy. They're a really good source of a bunch of different nutrients that your body can use. So the greens are really great. The, um, the root is a really long tap root, and you can dig that out. You can dry it and chop it up, make it into tea. Um, you can roast it somewhat and use it as a coffee substitute, which does not taste like coffee. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so really, from in the flowers, um, people use them to make wine, and you can also like dip them in breading, whatever, and deep fry them, wow. and then they're really tasty. <laughs> I've never had them, but. <laughs> Have you done them that way, the flowers? No, I just uh, yeah. chop them up and sprinkle them on everything. They're, they're, you can chop them up and sprinkle them, and they're pretty, too. So, and you make jelly, I think, with the flowers if you pick the petals and... I don't know, anyway, people hate them. Gardeners hate them because they will take over your garden. Um, but that just means that they're super successful. They only grow in disturbed areas. They're not taking over the forest. And you can use literally every single part of the plant and they're really good for bees. So, dandelions are great. Did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, the orange hopweed is another one that people hate, and not as much as dandelions. I don't think that anything gets hated as much as dandelions, but the hopweed is another one that's um, classified as an invasive species in this area. It's kind of fairly recently moved in here sometime in the last few decades or something. So it's not indigenous to this area. And so there are people who are you know, pretty exercised about that. Oh my gosh. It only lives in disturbed areas. And it's not taking over the forest. It's not taking over any um, areas that are still pristine, basically. Um, bees like these as well. I don't know of any human uses for them, um, except that they're pretty and they smell really good. Um, so. I'm not opposed to the orange hawkweed. Some people are, maybe I don't know enough to know that I should be worried about it. But since they're only in disturbed areas and not taking everything over, I'm kind of like, all right. Um, the purple asters can grow in disturbed areas and then also along um, like pathways and such. And uh, marshlands a little bit as well. Um, pretty common, the aster subspicatus. And 
There's goat's beard, and that also does well mostly in disturbed areas around Hillsville. One of the, I mean, along roadsides, um, this can get into your garden, and it's really a problem too. Um, I actually am not particularly fond of this one because it makes a lot of pollen, and I react badly to that. Um, but oh well. Um, and the fireweed, Camarian augustifolium. Um, it's not invasive. It is one of our, our native plants here, and it is uh, called fireweed for several different reasons why people call it fireweed. Um, I've heard that it's called fireweed because it will come back after an area is burned. It's one of the first plants to come back in significant numbers of, you know, whatever. Um, the foliage, when it's in the fall, will turn really blaze orange, kind of bright, fiery kind of. Um, and the whole field of it being red looks kind of like fire, too. Anyway, and that's, it. that's edible. Mm -hmm. um, the shoots, when they're pretty small, are nice and tasty. Mm -hmm. After they get about that tall, a little taller, they start getting really bitter. Um, they're still pretty tender. If you don't mind the taste of bitter, they're kind of nice. But they are pretty bitter. Um, so you want to get them when they're pretty small. And the flowers, you can harvest those and you can make them into a tea. You can make them into jelly, which is really lovely. Um, put, them on, put them on your salad. Put them on your salad. Nice mm -hmm. addition to the salad. So we have a lot of fireweed right here, which is pretty nice. Um, we also have dwarf fireweed, or river beauty it's also called. And that's Camarilla latifolium. Um, so the fireweed, the full tall fireweed, can be taller than me, like, you know, I don't know eight or nine feet tall, something, or ten feet, whatever, ridiculously tall. Um, the river beauty or dwarf fireweed only gets like maybe that tall, okay? Flowers very similar mm. and the foliage is very similar, but they're much, much shorter. Um, and I don't know if those have the same uses. It's not as common as the, the full tall fireweed, so I just appreciate seeing it and kind of don't worry mm. about trying to use it. Uh, Muskeg ecosystem, how am I doing on time? Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the muskegs are the bog areas we have around here, peat bogs. And the defining plant in them is that peat, the sphagnum moss, which puts so much acid, acid in the water, makes the water really acidic, that the water is actually basically unusable for plants. And so this is effectively a dry wetland. Okay. And it has a very different uh, plant profile because of that. Things that live there have to be able to live without a whole lot of usable water. Um, Northern green orchid, like, where is this thing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is this guy right here. Uh -huh. And then there's another one over here. And they, they do get some of them pretty tall. And the flowers are these small little kind of guys off the side, kind of look like a bird head, kind of. Um, they do not have any smell at all. Plantothera aculonis. The white bog orchid um, photographs better, for one thing. Um, similar shape in the, the flower, and it smells delightful. Really a nice smell to it. But remember, again, is that these are orchids, and so you can't, don't pick them. You can smell them there, don't pick them. Uh, they're more plentiful than the other orchids I was showing you, but still not hugely common. Um, and then this is one of the ones I've... So this is, this is the Maiden Tresses Orchid. It looks quite a bit like the White Bog Orchid, mm -hmm. but the White Bog Orchid, the, the flowers are arranged kind of all the way around, like bottle brush kind of style. And the Maiden Tresses, they're stacked up in usually three or four long rows up the sides. And frequently, instead of being straight, stacked straight up, they're twisted. So... Um, and they do not smell at all, but they're cool looking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> these are in the muskeg as well, uh, swamp gentian, and these plant, they're teeny. The flowers are like, maybe they end up with my thumb, kind of little teeny flowers. Um, and I don't know of any use for these either, except that they look cool and they're pretty. Uh, 
So I was showing you pictures of the miniature dogwood before, and I just learned last summer actually that we have what's called dwarf dogwood as well. And it took me a while to figure this out because I was reading dwarf dog dogwood and I was thinking, well, that means miniature dogwood, right? Same thing as miniature. It's not. Miniature dogwood is smaller than dwarf dogwood. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so this is not as common and it grows only in the muskegs. Um, this plant was probably this tall. Mm -hmm. Very similar looking flower though. So, so there we go. Cornus swessica. Um, also in the muskeg um, is the bog laurel, or bog calmia is called, calmia microphylla, and it has this beautiful pink flower on it. Um, there's a similar looking one that, uh, bog rosemary, that has the same narrow kind of leaves. End of my pinky kind of sized pink flower, um, and both of those are poisonous. Um, so you don't want to mistake those for something you might want to harvest when you're out harvesting. Lobish cranberry, which makes a berry that is really delightful that you want, might want to eat. Um, starts out with this really sm kind of small umbel of little flowers. Um, and again, this, the plant's like this tall, like really pretty little. Um, also called lingonberry. And we have the bog cranberry around here as well. Um, the difference between those is that the, the flowers are right on the top of the stalk of the plant, the plant's little, and the flowers are like right on the, the plant stock and the berries will be too. With the bog cranberry, the plant, the like the stem of the plant ends clear back here and then there's these long thread-like stems that happen with the flower on the end of each one of those and then the berry will be on the end of that thread-like stem as well. So that's how you can tell the difference between those two different kinds of cranberries. Um, I didn't exactly know where to put the yellow pond lily, because it's not really forest or muskeg, they live in ponds. <laughs> so I put it in muskeg because muskegs have ponds. Um, they're co real common around here. Um, yellow pond lily, the new lutea, and it's pretty fun. The, the, the lily pads are up now, but they're not blooming out yet. And the skunk cabbage is a flower, but not the way people think think that it's a flower, okay? That yellow part's not the flower. That yellow part is called the spathe, and it is protecting the flowers. The flowers are these little teeny rough bits on the spadix, yeah. okay? That stalk is called the spadix, and it is rough because of all of the really teeny kind of hard little flowers on it. <laughs> and then that yellow, whole yellow part that people think of as being the flower, um, it's called the spathe, and it protects the whole stem as it's coming up. Um, yeah? I have a comment to make about that. One of my friends, supposedly friends, said you could eat that, and another friend and I oh bit into it. I was like biting into shards of glass. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, no, don't eat it. Don't, <laughs> eat it. don't, <laughs> don't, don't believe them. Um, there are people that, yeah. There's, <laughs> misrepresent that. Um, <laughs> deer eat it. And bears dig up the roots and eat the roots. Mm -hmm. And both of them have oxalic acid in it, and it's not fun. Um, apparently, bears use it as a la I'm not quite sure how people know this, but anyway, bears will eat the spring, <laughs> and it's a laxative. So go pee. They were probably going to poop anyway, but um, people can eat the root. If you dig up the root, it's kind of onion like layered it's kind of long and cylindrical and you can eat that but you need to like boil it and discard the water and boil it and discard the water like three or four times to get rid of the oxalic acid so it doesn't burn your mouth but then you can eat it i don't know that people do that all that much the skunk cabbage leaves which you can see some leaves coming up here and they can get big you can use those um to like wrap food in wrap food and cook it whatever but you don't want to eat this you're right you can <laughs> break off the spadix, which has a lot of pollen on it, and bust it into pieces, and put them on the end of sticks and use them <laughs> in fights with your siblings yeah. and your kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you can tell when it hits because the pollen makes a yellow sm smear. <laughs> <laughs> and then clear up to the top of the mountain, the alpine area. Um, this actually, the Yellow Mountain Heath um, is alpine to subalpine kind of a little bit, and those are really little. Um, 
with teeny yellow kind of um, spherical little flowers on it, which is kind of fun. I took that picture on Brown Mountain Road. Um, this is purple saxifrage. And you can see that the leaves are, are small and kind of plump um, and really minimized, very low to the ground. Um, flowers are a little bit bigger than that. Most of the plants you're gonna find in the alpine areas, it's so harsh up on top of the mountains and the cover of snow in the winter time and ice, whatever. The, the plants are usually really pretty small and minimized, um, which is pretty smart. Uh, Cooley's Buttercup is here. These last few pictures Rebecca Jackson um, took and, and let me use. Uh, Pixie-eyed primrose, which is awfully sweet. And bird's beak lousewort right here. That's one of the taller plants that I've seen up in the um, alpine area. And then there's this picture right here, which I actually don't know what it is. The closest thing it kind of looks like is the mountain harebell, um, Campania lasiocarpa, but there's problems with that because that has more than five petals. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And this looks like it probably has five petals. This might have five petals, but that one definitely has more than five petals. And the harebells or bluebells always have just five petals. And so I've looked through all the books I have, all the books in the library, looked online, and I've ordered another book. Because um, there's a, a book specifically about alpine plants that grow in this area that I don't have yet, but will soon. And then I'll be able to look that up because I, know, I need to know what that is now. <laughs> um, and I don't, I, nothing looks quite right as far as what that might be. It's a new so. species. <laughs> it, it's possible. In which case, Rebecca will be famous. <laughs> so, I've seen plants like that in the Alps where yeah. there'll be some flowers up a stalk or you know, a few, and yeah. then the one on top. Is it was different. Like a, it was like a big, mm. different one. Do you know what it was called? Um, I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have to look, I'll have to look. Yeah. At my yeah. Stuff, but it was yeah. in the, like the French Hills. Okay. It was kind of in common. alpine areas throughout. I mean, that's a very specific kind of an ecosystem. Yeah, and you actually, really you'll see wild um, foxgloves. The so I left it with this one at the end here because um, I'm all I I love teaching at the university here people bring in things they ask me pictures people tag me on Facebook or send me messages on Facebook with things what's this <laughs> sometimes I know and sometimes I'm like well um, I can Google things to figure it out and I'm always learning more. And this one, I'm still figuring out. So I love teaching, I love sharing my, my knowledge, and I love learning more things. So I'll figure that one out eventually. <laughs> Any questions? That's kind of, you were good about asking them once. You had to ask. Hillary. It can be alpine, yeah, yep. I know, I kind of tried to divide them up by like, I don't know, ecosystem kind of, but there's some things like, and you're right, that will grow from the beach all the way up to the alpine. And then other things that are like really specific to like, you know, not, only the musk eggs or whatever. Yeah. You had a question. I was just interested in, um, do they know, is there a way to know when dandelions came root on this continent? There are people that track things like this, and and um, I'm not. I'm a generalist. I'm like, okay, they they showed up sometime. Um, some of the really specific information that people that can get geeked on, like one thing, like you know, lichens or mosses or liverworts, and know everything about that. I'm kind of in awe of because I get distracted. I'm like, oh, but look at this cool thing over here. And I don't have that depth of knowledge, like, but um, there are people who know that and can track it and see, and they've, um, dandelions were not indigenous here, they've moved in since the last, since European contact in this area. 
So. Oh, the juniper berries that go around mm -hmm. here. Uh, do those have? Uh, I'm assuming little white flowers or. They'll. Hmm. I have not seen them flowering. Okay. I've. I. Uh, I should go out. I, well, I will keep an eye out for that. And if I ever see them flowering, I'll post it on Facebook. Okay. I because that's a good question. Uh, like when we went on that walk out mm -hmm. of Ward Lake and we were in the muskeg area, there yeah. was like a little patch of them. And I only saw just one tiny little patch of them. But they are kind of patchy. They are in the muskegs around here. The juniper is. Um, it's common juniper and the desmic berries. Did you see the, the, hmm. so the berries take a full year to ripen? Yeah. And so um, they stay whitish. Yeah, they're all white. You said they weren't ripe. Yet. And they're not ripe. They'll be ripe this year, last oh. year's berries. And then the berries that set on this year will be ripe next year. Oh. Hmm. So I'm not sure what the flower looks like. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't have any Arunca sylvester. Is there much of that here? Tell me what, okay. I don't know. I don't recognize the scientific oh, words. Say again. You, you had, had a goat's beard, beard that had oh. a different name. Yeah, she had Oh, here, right. Right. I'm not sure if it if it lives around here. That's a good question. Yeah, in all of the places. Does it does it look like that? Goat's yes. beard. Okay. How come I didn't? So you don't consider the daisies and the Lux Glove as wild I do, but I didn't have pictures of them. I kind of went through. I I mean, and I think I'm over my time anyway. And forget me not. So and forget me not. There, that's actually there are so many flowers, and that's another really great point. Is that I spent more than an hour talking about about 60 plants that have flowers here, and that's. I'm not even covering all of them. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So I had to I had to make some decisions. So I went with, okay, do I have a picture of it already? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Point. So is there a book you could recommend? Is it like is there a book at Pojar and McKinnon's book. Which one? Pojar and McKinnon. Oh, yeah. It's in it, that book right there. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me yeah. yeah. too. <laughs> okay, and so thank you to the live. Oh, you go ahead. Is your presentation available for sharing? Um, it could be. I hadn't considered that. <clears throat> yeah, the um, recorded. We're doing it 